Welcome back. We're in Chapter 4, talking about theatrical genres. This is Professor Seal from Motlow State Community College. So, when we talk about genres, it's, it may seem kind of like a simple thing. If you have a Netflix account or any sort of streaming account, you've probably seen these genres pop up. Um, sometimes they're vague, like comedy or tragedy, and sometimes they're very, very specific. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about those genres. Genres are not something that are specific to play. In our definition there, we have the word play, but obviously there are genres of music, there are genres of art, there are genres um, and pretty much um, any kind of thing. Uh, just like Aristotle wanted to create a classification system for the animals, we have that instinct to want to categorize art. Um, this is something someone made as kind of a spoof on the way that Netflix tries to guess or predict what we'll like based on other genres that we like. Um, genres are pseudoscientific. They are speculative. They are subjective. They are not exact sciences, right? Um, if you've ever had Netflix try to guess what other kind of movies you'd like, you could probably laugh at it, right? Just because I like Harry Potter doesn't mean that I'm going to like every sci-fi movie that's out there, right? So um, they're just one way to categorize and categories um, sometimes we have to make new ones sometimes a, a artist or a practitioner will resist what category they've been given right I used to like um, indie music and people would tell me it was emo and I hated that word emo right it was just a bad name a lot of bad music was in emo category that I thought was not um, the same as the kind of indie music that I liked. So genres are kind of meant to be broken. But the reason we have an entire lecture over genre is because it's super important for you as an audience member or also as an artist or a pr practitioner. You know if you're designing costumes for a goofy comedy that they should be colorful, they should help um, tell the story. If the actor has to move a lot, it should help them be goofy and funny on stage. Uh, as a lighting designer, if you're costuming a mystery, you know that it's going to have you know, darker tones and creepy shadows. And that's part of what we understand about the genre, right? We expect that as audience members. We expect that as actors, designers, uh, and critics. So you need to figure out for yourself what genres. And I do the, use the word plurally because, you know, if we look at this goofy picture here. Um, you can see several different kind of categories it's fitting, right? It's a violent thriller uh, about cats, right? So for ages 8 to 10. So some things that we ask ourselves is what, it, who is the audience intended? Is it for children? Is it for adults? Another question to ask yourself is how long is it? What's the duration of the play? Uh, remember for the purposes of our class, your live production critique needs to be um, at least two hours. The duration of the common play was between meals or between a meal and bedtime. So, you know, curtain is at seven o'clock, you watch a two and a half hour show, you're ready to go home and go to bed, right? You go on a matinee, you eat lunch, you go into the theater, by the time you get out of the theater, you're ready to eat dinner. So that's the traditional uh, piece of theater is going to be two and a half hours. As you can imagine, in our modern sensibility, theater keeps getting shorter and shorter because, um, you know, we live in a more fast paced society. Uh, if you look at something like Theater Dionysia, that ran all day long. They would get up with the sun, be in the theater when the sun came up. And uh, we know that because all of these plays start with sun up. So they're using their surroundings, they're using the real environment to tell the story. And then, you know, they would go away and eat a meal and come back and watch another play. And they'd go away and eat a meal and watch another play. And then they'd be dismissed to go to sleep. So. That two and a half hours is sort of the normal, but we have short plays, 10 minute plays, 30 minute plays. Um, a lot of modern plays are gonna be less than two hours if they're um, not musicals, because we as audience members just have a shorter kind of sensibility. So speaking of, you know, modern plays tend to be a little shorter, um, more classical plays tend to be a little longer, although good directors often cut them down for their modern audiences, because they just know they don't wanna sit there that long. So 
we look at, for example, whodunits, uh, great detective plays of the 1940s and 50s. So there are certain genres that typify an era, certain really popular plays um, that sort of distinctly happen in the time capsule that was that age. So we'll talk about that a little bit more and go back over this at the end. So <laughs> white people almost kissing that, that meme cracked me up so I added added it. So um, it is true that some playwrights or authors, no, no diss against Nicholas Sparks, I am a big fan of the notebook. Uh, yes, I am basic. Uh, but uh, when you criticize a playwright or a genre, you need to make sure that you're criticizing it for what it is, right? Um, Nicholas Sparks writes sort of, we expect the same kind of story from him over and over again. And a lot of playwrights have the same sort of um, sensibility. You know, we look at a great director like Tim Burton. We go to a Tim Burton movie, what do we expect? We expect to see Johnny Depp acting. We expect to see dark tones. We expect a little bit of twisted hu humor. We expect, um, uh, you know, and even, even within his work, there's a lot of diversity, but we still kind of know the sensibilities of that director. This goes back to those same questions we asked in chapter one. What does the play want us to feel? Nicholas Sparks wants us to fall in love, right? He wants us to uh, empathize with this romantic couple and he wants us to fall in love. So if we walk away ridiculously from the movie The Notebook and we are not in love with our hero, right? Um, and his persistence in the face of his wife's um, Alzheimer's, then, then that movie wasn't successful, right? Because Nicholas Sparks wants us to embrace the romance. He wants us to love our main characters. And the question is not what did you want to get out of the movie, right? If I go into the notebook and I say, that didn't scare me at all. It's not a scary movie. It's not meant to scare me right? Uh, we have to ask, what is that playwright or that screenwriter intending, and did they make me feel that way? If I walk into a scary movie and I'm laughing the whole time, that scary movie was not successful because I laughed. So pretty simplistic concept, but it is something I see over and over again when we write those big papers where people um, are looking for something that that play was not trying to deliver, right? Dun, dun, dun. So, um, if you haven't already noticed, I have added a lot of clips in your D2L shell, and I would appreciate it if you haven't already to go ahead and pause this video and go watch the clip of Oedipus, because it's one thing for me to sort of speak about these um, esoterically. It's another thing for you to actually have an example of something in front of you that's going to help you understand what I am talking about. So. Tragedy um, is serious drama, right? Particularly serious drama where that tragic hero does meet their downfall at the end of the play. We already talked about Oedipus, but I've included a great clip um, from uh, the version by Frank McGinnis that was done at the National Theater. And you can hear the poetry of it, right? The poetry speaks in verse, and they rhapsodize about their conundrum. They're facing a world that is indifferent and harsh towards their problem. Um, and as we also said in chapter one, usually a tragic hero is going to be a king or a queen or prince or princess. And, you know, people try to put that off on Disney, like, how dare they include so much royalty? But um, that's all classical storytelling, a lot of classical storytelling, is going to be centered around someone, as Aristotle said, who is worthy of our time and attention. So just because this hero has a tragic flaw doesn't mean they're not somebody who we can't admire, right? We all have flaws. That would be the premise of the Hellenistic view, worldview, right? Um, th th would have been that we are born into this world flawed, uh, sinful creatures, people who can't help, and that we have this world that is harsh and, and un, um, unsympathetic, unkind, 
and that tragic hero gets stuck in a situation that is irretrievable, a situation they have no choice but to move forward in. And usually that tragic hero accepts their own responsibility. So we see it over and over again. As we said, Oedipus gouges out his own eyes. Othello kills himself after he strangles his wife in bed. Spoiler alert, sorry. Um, You know, then he turns around and kills himself because he realizes the weight of what he's done. Hamlet goes into this situation, um, this duel, knowing he'll probably die, right? So even though he was poisoned, he, you know, for lack of a better word, he went into it suicidal because we know that something bad's going to happen. So usually the playwright is in some ways what we would call a Christ figure. Uh, before you call the dean and say that I'm getting in preachy, uh, Christ figure is a term that we use in film and theater uh, that doesn't necessarily mean the Christian worldview. We just mean that there's a character who's making a sacrifice for the good of the whole. So E.T., even though it's written by Steven Spielberg, is a Christ figure. He lays down his life for uh, the good of the whole. So usually a tragic hero is still a hero. There may be something about them that uh, makes them fall, but it's still someone worthy of our attention, someone that we want to engage in the story with. We don't have tragedy in the same way that we used to. Your textbook kind of has a little nuanced conversation about it, um, but I would tend to disagree with what he calls modern tragedy, right? Um, Because remember we said the purposes of the classical works were to create catharsis, to purge us of these big emotions. Imagine thousands of people weeping in the theater. Then we have Shakespeare's day, which was a neoclassical era where people discovered these um, ancient works and they re sort of invented their own stories, but still in the same model that the classic stories were. And really to once again, create that same sense of suffering, that same to watch someone like Macbeth, uh, you know, travel down that road and leads to destruction. And we all mourn it. We all feel pity for that character. Um, He tries to call, say that there's some sort of modern tragedy. I would argue that those are dramas, right? Tragedy and drama are kind of not really synonyms. And if you look at different literary, but I'm getting into the minutiae. Y'all don't really care about the minutiae. So often a tragic hero will speak in verse, And remember we said the poor people, this is a clip from Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, I just acted in Midsummer Night's Dream last fall as I record this. And so it's one that sort of, you know, ripe in my head. Forgive me if I overuse Midsummer Night's Dream as an example, but it's one that's sort of still in my mind's eye. So this is a conversation um, between Bottom the Weaver. That was the guy who is the um, donkey that, he turned into a donkey he was an actor so bottom is turns into an ass and he is very gritty character very down-to-earth character very goofy a total fool somebody we all laugh at Um, and he is giving direction to the other actor some man or other must be present while let him have some plaster or some loam and some rough cast about him to signify a wall and let him hold his fingers thus right holding his fingers apart kind of like the um star trek symbol if you're familiar uh fellow nerds and through that cranny shall pyramus and thisbe whisper so everybody is speaking in prose these are the common people remember in the version that we staged the nashvillians if that i may be then all is well come sit down every mother's son and rehearse your part pyramus you begin then you have spoken your speech enter into that break and everyone according to his cue so quince who's the director she is giving um also in prose she's speaking just in everyday rhythms no special attention to the rhythm then we have robin goodfellow come in commonly known as puck right and puck is a fairy puck is royalty puck is a magical creature so you can see the biggest indicator that this is poetry is underneath Robin at the bottom of the page you can see all capitalized letters and that is our indication that we've switched into in the case of Shakespeare iambic pentameter 
right? Um, which is to say five I am's unstressed stress, unstressed stress syllable. What hemp and homespuns have we swaggered here, so near the cradle of the fairy queen? What a play toward I'll be an auditor, an actor too, perhaps if I see cause, right? And Robin is speaking in verse. So the clip I showed you of Othello, not Othello, sorry, uh, Oedipus, you can hear Oedipus speaking in his kingly way in his verse. Now that doesn't mean to say that every single jot and tittle is going to be in verse. It just means that the the poetic leaders. And now, when does a character speak in prose and when do they speak in verse? Usually when their heart speeds up is when they're going to switch into verse. So the moment that Juliet walks into the party... Romeo switches into verse, right? That's an important mo mo moment in his life. He switches into poetry. And this reflects everyday life, right? We're not paying attention to the way that we talk, but when things get important, a funeral, a um, moment where we're trying to persuade someone. Now, does Juliet's nurse ever speak in verse? No. Right, which is part of what I think is wrong with these classic plays, that we don't see a lot of depiction of the common man. Um, although one of my favorite Shakespeare's plays, Merry Wives of Windsor, is down-to-earth women, and they speak in verse the whole time, I mean in poetry, the not in poetry, in prose, the whole show, uh, they hardly ever speak in verse, and it's still a fantastic play. So don't mean to be so hard on Shakespeare. He just represents for us classical theater in a lot of ways in the Western world because he's the one that we're still familiar with. He was only copying a model that, um, that we follow. So these Shakespearean characters, these classical characters, Sophocles, Euripides, they're going to write in poetry right? So if you know that you love poetry, then I would encourage you to catch a classic play. If you, for example, know that you get confused or frustrated when you're reading poetry, I would challenge you to pick for your live production critique, not a classic play. So as I said, it was popular in ancient Greece, and then it was popular again in the neoclassic age, including Shakespeare and Moliere. Um, but really, that's the only time we see classic tragedy. Now, Arthur Miller, who is one of the greatest playwrights of the last hundred years, he wrote a play, Death of a Salesman, and he set out to write a tragedy of a modern age. So he very intentionally wrote Willie Low Man, and you can hear that in his name. He was a low man who was a modern day uh, king, as it were. He was a salesman. Um, so we have a lot of those same tropes of the tragedy, tragedians, but Arthur Miller's being very intentional about that, right? He set out to write a tragedy. And man, is that play depressing. It is so hard to get through. I don't know if you've ever read it or watched it, um, but it is just sad thing after sad thing after sad thing. And particularly if you've been a person of middle or lower class, he's, um, Willie Loman is suffering through debt. His wife, um, he is suicidal because of his debt. And he's trying to relieve, he can no longer work, and he's trying to relieve that debt and burden off of his family. And... Uh, Man, is it a heavy play. So sad. If you need a good cry, go watch Dustin Hoffman's Death of a Salesman. Um, and if you don't cry, I would question whether or not you have a soul. So what kind of forms do dramas come into? I'm going to once again resist that urge to call them tragedies. But we have heroic dramas, which um, have a sense of optimism um, about sort of the world as opposed to a classic tragedy. Um, some of those hero dramas, as they're calling them in this book, heroic dramas, can be classified as romanticism. Romanticism. So we had a kind of theater right before romanticism called classicism. And classicism was part of that neoclassic movement where everyone spoke in rhyming couplets. Uh, rhyming couplets means that the last word of the line would rhyme with the one after it. Um, and for example, every Shakespeare sonnet ends with a rhyming couplet. Uh, that quote that I've used several times so far in the class, uh, as the sun is daily new and old, so is my love of telling what is told. So right, we have that 
repeated rhythm and that last line rhyming. Now if you know anything about playwriting or songwriting, uh, Rhyming can be, can sound pedantic, it can sound like a little kid story, right, if you're not careful. And Romanticism was a reaction against Classicism. Classicism stuck to those Aristotelian, um, remember, one time, one place, one setting, uh, very rigid sense of beauty and that things had to be balanced and logical. That was what classicism was. Romanticism was a reaction against that. And they said, let's explore the extremes. Let's find um, the grittiest, uh, most... Um, earthy, real, let's create monsters, let's create huge things that are illogical. So this is where we get some of my favorites, including Victor Hugo's Les Miserables, uh, which you may be familiar with. Uh, in French, that just means the miserable. <laughs> Not exactly a great poster for coming to watch the play, but it really is a beautifully cathartic play about revolution. And Victor Hugo wrote lots of romantic um, stories. He was also a contemporary of Charles Dickens. So when we look at a play um, like Christmas Carol, which to this day is one of the most produced plays in America, um, you know, once again, we see ghosts showing up to tell messages. We see starving Tiny Tim, whose malnutrition has warped his bones, right? We're really exploring these extreme um, ideas and physical limitations and we're battling with the spiritual which is why ghosts shows ghosts show up so often in romantic uh, literature and romantic plays so when the movie version of Les Mis came out <laughs> and I won't keep this picture up for long uh, you can see um, the teeth right those gritty extremes the director really chose to embrace romanticism and embrace sort of the gritty reality of victor hugo's writing and traditional theater goers quite a few who i ran in circles with were like that movie was just gross right but if we really read um george bernard shaw uh, you know Charles Dickens, Victor Hugo, they're writing about starving children, uh, you know, malnutrition. They want to get our attention. They want to grab us with these extremes. I mean, just look at the premise of Bram Stoker's Dracula, right? Drinking blood is really kind of an extreme thing. I think it's interesting. I think now um, we've seen sort of a rebirth of neo-romanticism with our obsession with monsters and... Um, I wonder also if that has to do with extravagance and the differences like in Victorian England we had you know starving children but also beautifully regaled women and sort of that dichotomy between the gender um, not the gender gap the pay gap right uh, the extreme wealth and extreme poverty and I wonder if in some ways if that has affected our romanticism but I speculate. These are the things that we as critics like to sit around and kind of ponder about um, is, you know, what are these genres and why are they resurfacing? So domestic dramas, which I would often argue uh, is more commonly called realism, right? Realism is family problems, most often in lower or middle class characters. My favorite is Raisin in the Sun by uh, the great Lorraine Hansberry. Um, I've given you a video clip with Sean Combs or P. Diddy, uh, Felicia Rashad, uh, fantastic actors. And it is by far the most common thing that's produced for straight plays uh, through the last hundred years. Often we're dealing with a family dynamic, we're dealing with talking about money, talking about everyday problems. So when you read um, a classical drama, you're not going to deal with bouncing a check or cashing a check. That's the kind of we open and start Raisin in the Sun and they're talking about getting money, right? In that brass tax way that they're sort of negotiating. Um, when 
Lorraine Hansberry set out to write A Raisin in the Sun, she did choose Walter Lee as her hero. And she has some um, criticism that she wrote kind of about why she chose a person who was just a driver, a chauffeur. And she wanted people to think more deeply about the casual servants they may have experienced in their life right that lower class hero that person who you know a doorman or a chauffeur somebody you might overlook but who has a real existence and in these classical plays someone that may have been a one-dimensional character she was trying to bring out the angst and the frustration of being lower class and what it does to us um, which is the poem that you hear in that clip that i listed there um, is by langston hughes he was a part of the harlem renaissance he was a poet and he writes about the african-american experience and comparing it to um, you know a raisin drying up in the sun what does a person do when they are starved of their experience when they're starved of their opportunity so it's really a beautiful story that i'm sure i'll bring up over and over again in this class because it's one of my favorite plays so so realistic drama and i would argue that there are moments in Raising the Sun that are melodramatic, but most of it's going to sound like everyday speech. Most of it's going to reflect the way that people on the streets are talking, realism, domestic dramas are. Melodrama is going to be heightened language. So this is an image of Mousetrap when we did it at Motlow, directed by a Jeannie Tucker Brown Gallant. She's the one sitting there with flowers in her lap. It was a great play, um, big, beautiful set. That, Kurt has designed there. I've given a clip of Mousetrap as it's running on the West End because it's a very popular play. It's been running for many, many years. You can go and find out who done it there. Um, written by the incomparable Agatha Christie. If you've never uh, read any of her novels or plays, I challenge you to go out and do it. Agatha Christie always writes a bad guy who is really, really bad, right? In these detective stories, we have this sort of moment where we find out who the bad guy is, and they usually have a big, long speech explaining <laughs> what motivates them and why they've done this horrible thing. Um, spy movies, uh, lots, of, lots of melodramas, as I said before, when I showed that picture of Babes in Toyland, you know, the villain is twirling his mustache and wahaha, laughing over melodramatically. Um, I, as a feminist, sometimes have problems with melodrama because there's usually a young helpless woman um, tied to the railroad tracks or in some way in trouble who needs rescuing. Although Agatha Christie, of course, uh, didn't write women like that because she is a woman. So, um, But a lot of melodramatic plays, such as action movies, have received criticism because there's usually a young helpless woman involved. These reached their height in the 19th century with swashbuckling plays. Um, a lot of silent films, early silent films, are melodramatic. Um, that's sort of uh, what was popular at that moment. As I said, sometimes uh, period typifies uh, the style. So 19th century was when melodrama peaked. So we talked about this last class, but melodrama often includes a stock character. Right? We expect certain behaviors from our heroes. We expect certain behaviors from our villains. To the much chagrin of us ladies, we expect certain behaviors from the victim female, the person who's desperate to be rescued. So um, if you go to see a melodrama, you can spend your efforts and spend your wheels critiquing uh, the way that gender is depicted or critiquing um, the tropes that exist or the stock characters that exist, but just know that that's what typifies a melodrama. If you're not interested in seeing a shallow story, then maybe don't go see a melodrama. Moving on to comedy. I will say I shamelessly prefer the comedies. <laughs> so, long time ago, Aristotle said of comedy, it kiss consists of some defect or ugliness which is not painful or destructive. To take an obvious example, the comic mask is ugly and distorted, but it does not imply pain, right? So, when Wile E. Coyote jumps off the cliff and falls to his death, uh, he doesn't actually die, right? we laugh at the comedy of ha ha he was mortally wounded but he doesn't actually die 
right? And that's part of the fun of comedy, is that um, it doesn't imply pain, at least in the classical sense. Now we'll get into tragic comedy here in a second. So let's compare the two forms. Comedy usually celebrates love, right? We have two characters at cross purposes. We have a birth. We have um, the beginning of life in some way. Whereas tragedy usually contemplates morality, mortality. Someone in like Hamlet is sitting around asking to be or not to be. That is the question, whether it is better, right? They're sitting and suffering. We look at uh, Oedipus. He's sitting around wondering about these starving people around him, about these dying crops. Comedy usually ends in a wedding, which we already said, and tragedy ends in death. Yay! Um, a comedy usually happens in a social group. So we look at a story like Friends, right? All of these friends in apartments, they spend, even though they're in their 30s, they spend copious amounts of time together. Do they have jobs? They say they have jobs, but they never seem to be working them, <laughs> right? So lots of people in a social group interacting with social nuance. Um, Whereas in tragedy, now that doesn't mean that it's a one-man show, it just means that that person feels alone. They may be talking to a chorus of people and saying how alienated they feel, right? Um, there's no co-conspirator in their resolution. They are up to themselves. In comedy, characters are often in some way pitiable. They're fatter than you. They're stupider than you. They're um, uh, a weakling and they can't keep up. They're not strong enough, right? And that's part of the formula of comedy, that they are in some way stupid, pitiable, fat, ridiculous. So tragedians tend to be intelligent. They tend to be royal. They tend to be in the line of success succession. Comedy is a relatively painless world, according to Aristotle's model, whereas tragedy, we have a whole slew of cathartic, painful, unapathetic. That's the sort of model philosophically that we're walking into. In comedy, ridiculous, ludicrous things happen, and they happen in extreme, right? Like I said, Wiley e. Coyote falls off the cliff. Things explode. Uh, you know, Cartman on South Park, his head explodes. Uh, these are things that are illogical and ridiculous. Ah. Whereas, oh, sorry, tragedy, we have logical consequences. We already talked about that and how um, logically ordered a lot of these ancient Grecian comedies were, uh, tragedies were. They believed there was a sin, and that sin needed to be accounted for. So if we look at Oedipus, we see that once he gouged his own eyes out, once he exiled himself, order was restored to the city of Thebes, right? Because he was the scapegoat. He was the problem. So back to comedy, right? This is Bill Irwin. Bill Irwin um, is a um, fantastic clown actor. You may have seen him as Mr. Noodle on Sesame Street. Uh, he is a mime and he does a lot of physical comedy. So the clip that I have included is of Scapan and you can see people falling down, people uh, misdirection. It's almost like Charlie Chaplin. Charlie Chaplin was a tramp as well and did a lot of this slapstick comedy, right? Um, the slapstick, the word, actually comes from a, um, a device that had a hinge on it and you could rear it back and thwack and the two pieces of wood are held together with the, a hinge and it would make a big thwack slap every time you reared it back and um, it mimicked the sound of wood hitting uh, something, right? So the slapstick was used in Commedia dell'arte for people to pretend like they were hitting their servants or in the traditional Italian Punch and Judy, Judy shows for Punch to pretend to hit his wife Judy, right? Ha ha, hilarious, beating your wife. Um, but that slapstick was the sound of the two pieces of wood hinged, whacking together. So um, Punch and Judy once again, hasn't aged well, but um, 
when we think about clowning, when we think about um, sticky comedy, physical comedy, um, we think about uh, lots of great actors like Carol Burnett or uh, Lucy um, from I Love Lucy. They were great slapstick comedians. So part of the way that comedy is set up is incongruity, right? So you usually have to have um, inappropriate behavior, right, in a specific circumstance. John Leguizamo, I can't even show clips from John Leguizamo's humor because often it is so inappropriate that you would turn me into my dean. So <laughs> just trust me when I say the king of inappropriate humor, one of my favorites, John Leguizamo. So... So for incongruity, you often have to have a straight character and then the funny person. So uh, Gilda Radner, one of my all-time favorite SNL uh, actors, she uh, you know, wrote in her journals that um, I have Bill Murray there, but actually Belushi was the one who gave her such hard time about writing sketches and just saying, I need a girl, I need any girl. And often the girl had to kind of play the straight character, the one that was normal, while Belushi's character got to be crazy or off the wall. And she grew out of that. She she grew to stand up for herself and say, no, I'm funny. Let me play the funny characters. Um, but even when I was coming up, SNL, I saw so many really funny women have to play the normal kind of straight character while the men got to joke around and be the funny ones. Um, but incongruity, in order formula-wise for a joke to land, usually you have to have people acting normal and that one person acting crazy, right? It can't work if everybody's acting crazy. So the comedy comes from having a straight man and a funny man. So when you watch a sitcom, you can see there are those characters who don't have a shtick, who don't do crazy things. They're often what we would, in comedy worlds, would refer to as the straight man. Um, and unfortunately, women have often been relegated to the straight man in comedies. Uh, if we look at something like Everybody Loves Raymond, not, I don't mean to pick on any one show, uh, but you know, there's a funny man and his uh, wife has to be the the punishing normal one. So, farce. Yay, farce. Farce is a kind of comedy uh, that is fast-paced. I have a picture here of Noises Off, and I've included a, a video clip of Noises Off. Um, Noises Off is a play within a play um, that is uh, emphasizes uh, it's about these actors and sort of the things that happen within it. I actually took a group to see um, when we did it at the Tennessee Rep at TPAC, and it was so funny. It is a sex farce, and so if you go to read about the play, you know that it's a sex farce, and if that's something that makes you uncomfortable, by all means, don't go see Noises Off. I had some students who didn't read about Noises Off before they went, and they were very uncomfortable, not with the Manchester version, but with the Nashville version that we saw of the Tennessee Rep. When you think farce, it's often uh, synonymous with physical comedy, fast, fast physical comedy. Ridiculous extremes, people slamming doors, walking in and out. Um, farces can get us in trouble because the motive behind a farce is often revolution right poking fun at the status quo a show like um like the simpsons can get in a lot of trouble because they're poking fun at and poking holes in um the ideas of the day and so when somebody uh like Kanye West sues South Park and says you can't air that episode. It's not that the frothy comedy uh, is ridiculous, it's that it's hitting a little too ho close to home, right? It's telling the truth a little too well, and so Kanye presses charges, right? Like I said, it's fast-paced, it's punctuated, it's clean comedy, and uh, it's often ridiculous. Satire is sometimes synonymous with farce but it just has a little bit more in attack mode a little more iron irony a little more expose um i have a clip of spam a lot i'm currently choreographing spam a lot at south jackson my uh, local community theater 
so funny, so funny. And what it does is it satirizes Camelot, right? And there we have Tim Curry playing the part of King Arthur. Those times of knights and princesses and dragons is often romanticized in our mind. But when we actually look at the time period, not of dragons, but of knights, uh, we see, you know, the death toll. And uh, there's a lot of comedy uh, in Spam a lot, this kind of poking fun at how we idealize this time and uh, the idea of knights. One of my favorite songs is We Are Not Yet Dead, which is all about celebrating that, hey, we're in our 30s and we're not dead yet, right? Uh, it's exaggerated, it's ironic, it's tongue-in-cheek, um, but once again, um, Spamalot is, ver is based on Monty Python and the Holy Grail, which was also sort of a bad, uh, biting satire if you've ever seen that movie. Um, but you go into it, once again, knowing that they're going to pick on. And so if you don't like humor, if you don't have a sense of humor about, for example, um, your religion or politics, you know, uh, Book of Mormon is a great example of a satire that's making fun. It's by the South Park creators making fun of the Mormon faith. If you're a very religious person, maybe don't choose to go see that religious satire, right? Tartuffe by Moliere is another religious satire. Uh, you know, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, uh, more so in Meaning of Life or Life with Brian, you know, those... Uh, they got in a lot of trouble for saying those things about the Catholic Church. So if you don't have a sense of humor about your religion or about your politics, please don't go see a satire because they're going to poke fun at the things that are sacred in our mind's eye. That's kind of the hallmark of a satire. So we've talked about tragedy and we've talked about comedy. Let's move into talking about a tragic comedy, right? Um, a tragedy now even in the most tragic of plays there might be a comic scene so we've got Macbeth right uh, the witch is telling me he needs to be king sadness sadness death he's killing everyone his wife is going crazy his wife dies he's about to kill himself right and still in the midst of that we'll have little one-liners that Shakespeare throws in there just as kind of a little bit of comic relief that's not necessarily a tragic comedy we're more talking about mm, plays where there's comic elements and serious elements back to back. So for if we look at like a Chekhov play, there is a character with squeaky shoes and he's a servant and he's frustrated about his shoes squeaking. And then he, uh, this is a, a play called Cherry Orchard and he's been a servant in this orchard his whole life. And at the end of the play, when they're closing, they've gone bankrupt and they're closing down this great estate in the cherry orchard, he lies down on the, the stage and dies. A huge critique of what it means to be a servant and when the Bolshevik Revolution happened, how this whole class of um, maids and butlers and things uh, didn't know what to do with themselves. Uh, but we've got comedy mixed in with the tragedy, right? Squeaky shoes, he walks with his squeaky shoes out to the middle of the stage, lays down and dies. Simultaneously funny and tragic. We look at dark comedies uh, where you know people are dying but it's still funny. A lot of D Danny DeVito movies are, are dark comedies. And sometimes we've got a serious theme but there's an ironic or a comic twist to it. Right? Someone is sort of grinning as they say something maliciously horrible. <laughs> right? Um, a lot of modern plays. Now, <laughs> Aristotle did not think, as we already said, he thought we should keep our comedies comic and our tragic tragic, uh, tragedies tragic, and most playwrights towed the Aristotle line. They followed his advice. They tried to make um, comedies really funny and tragedies really tragic. Uh, Shakespeare was one of the exceptions to that. He has what are so-called problem plays, plays that have both comedy and tragedy back to back. Uh, Chekhov, as I already said, he set out to write a comedy and then um, Stanislavski called it a tragedy because they're so comically tragic that it's hard to tell the difference. The example I have here is from Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Uh, this is a great absurd tragic comedy where they're a bit cracking jokes even, even as the noose is going around their neck. <laughs> um, 
And so a lot of modern plays are probably more tragicomedy uh, because we just expect more nuanced characters nowadays. We've kind of gotten away from melodrama and classic tropes. We tend to be a little more um, cynical. So tragicomedy is often cynical. Waiting for Godot is sort of our typical absurd play, but a lot of modern um, things can be classified as absurd. I would argue that SpongeBob SquarePants, um, you know, SpongeBob SquarePants, the musical just came to Broadway and is touring around the country right now, and I would say that it's delightfully absurd. You never know what's going to happen as SpongeBob. You never know um, what kind of crazy off-the-wall thing is going to happen. It's sort of the absurd humor as well. The philosophical undercurrent of absurdity is strong. In fact, these philosophical um, writers set out to write plays to communicate things to mass audiences. They didn't have churches with which to propagate their, um, their atheism, but they would use the theater to kind of get out these messages after the World War, um, the Second World War where everyone is performing plays in the rubble. You know, France and Paris was a hot spot for this alienation, this absurd um, philosophy and absurd plays. We look at a play like Rhinoceros, where um, the, the people in the town are slowly turning into a rhinoceros, and we think, oh, well, that's just so ridiculous. But, you know, only in the past decade, all of these people welcomed in the Nazis with open arms. And, you know, we are in some ways herding animals. So this extended metaphor of people becoming rhinoceri is sort of, I don't think rhinoceri is right, but people becoming rhinoceroses. And it, it makes for a lot of sh funny shtick. If you're a fan of um, Gene Wilder, he did a movie with Zero Mostel of the rhinoceroses and I would highly recommend it. I don't know what the plural of rhinoceros is. Oh, well. Um, but absurdity portrays a sense of ridiculousness, right? Um, the kind of one of the central things about um, absurdity came from Camus, and he is a great philosopher. And he said there's a separation between man and his life, the actor and his setting, which constitute the feeling of absurdity. And that's where kind of that term came from. Um, Camus, when he explained kind of the philosophy of absurdity, he used the myth of Sisyphus. Uh, Sisyphus is a Greek myth of a man who would carry a rock up a hill and this is what he was damned to do over and over and over again, right? Is carry a rock up a hill. Um, you know, there are other myths about, um, um, you know, a character who gets his liver eaten out by wild birds. And that happens over and over again. And it's just the repetition, repetition, repetition. If I am working a crap job and I have to say over and over again, welcome to Walmart, how can I help you? Welcome to Walmart, how can I help you? Not picking on Walmart, I'm just saying that redundancy, that ridiculousness of repetition, repetition, repetition. And in some ways, uh, we can number all our days and we can um, spoon them out and see the repetition in our institutions, in our daily grind. Um, and the absurd plays are going to highlight that and they're going to make fun of it right? Often humorously. A lot of these absurd plays to be about atheism and alienation and uh, despair are quite funny, right? Um, the the example I use is Waiting for Godot. Uh, we can see Ian McKellen and Patrick Stewart. They're great comic actors and they'll say things like, we should go, and then they don't go. Or, Godot should be here any minute. Gatto still doesn't show up, right? And the absurdity of their circumstances, the absurdity of what they're waiting for. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern is also an absurd play, um, a little less so because there is a beginning, middle, and end, whereas Waiting for Gatto, spoiler alert, he never shows up. They stay there the whole show. It's pretty uh, futile, right? And we see it also in the language. 
repetitive language, nonsense language, language that um, doesn't mean anything, people speaking in gibberish. So there's a great example here on page 97 of your textbook. Oh, no, no, 99 of your textbook. Uh, in Waiting for God, oh, there is a um, character, Lucky, who comes in and speaks in religious language that's just sort of uh, meaningless, right? Given the existence as uttered forth in the public works of Puncher and Watman, of a personal god, qua 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 qua, the white beard, qua 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 qua, outside time without ex extension from whom the heights of divine apathia, divine athabia, divine aphasia, loves us dearly, right? So, part farce, as we were just talking about. You can imagine Waiting for Gatto uh, incited the crowds of people to um, riot, right, uh, in protest of this idea of waiting for God and God never showing up. Um, and lots of these absurd plays were cathartic for a war, a generation war-torn, a generation where all of the things that they were promised um, didn't come true. All of the logical things they expected from their life in an age of industrialism, in an age of um, what used to be prosperity is now war-torn and meaningless. And so we see that reflected in these plays. And it's not that these plays really typify an era, these absurd plays. They deal with the heaviness, the disillusionment, the pain that was going on at that specific moment in history. Now some people like John Patrick Shanley are still writing sometimes in the absurd style, but the pure absurd plays were really an experiment in atheism that uh, were very public way of sorting through philosophically the disappointment that a lot of people were having with the church and with their institutions and their governments, right? So, as I already said, be careful when assigning a genre to something. Don't expect it to tick every box. Right? Okay, this is a comedy. It's going to be lighthearted. Tick. It's going to be slapsticky. Tick. Uh, you can't put any play in a box. I love that moment in Moana where she's stuck in uh, a little box in her boat, and he's talking to her about what a princess is and what a princess isn't. Uh, critics will try to narrowly define a piece of art, but artists will continue to break out of those bounds and create new styles and create new genres, and that's part of the excitement of it and comparing it. And you can always look at a piece of work and see its influences, right? Um, influence being film or music. Uh, how did this play come out of the things that came before it? Does it follow into a typical mystery or does it break the rules in some way? It informs us as actors, critics, and designers. It may be fair of you to critique and say, you know, this was a goofy comedy, but that actor just didn't have a sense of humor. So that humor didn't come through. That actor doesn't need to do comedies. Right, that's a way to critique based on genre. And as I said, some genres typify an era, right? In our modern world with more media than we've ever had, more theater than we've ever had, you can find a play out there that suits you. You can find a dark comedy. You can find a goofy comedy. You can find a goofy comedy for eight to 10 year olds with cats in it, right? <laughs> Whatever uh, is suits your tastes in the age, uh, golden age of television, uh, wonderful time where the arts are thriving, you can find um, what suits you and what you like. So I would encourage you to read the criticism before you go in. Make sure you understand the genre before you sit down to that play. If it's going to be a tragedy, bring your tissues. If it's going to be a comedy, uh, you know, come ready to laugh. Be that encouraging audience member who helps that production thrive. So um, genre is important and I hope now that you can understand it and walk away with a greater, deeper ability to categorize plays and appreciate them for what they are, not what you want them to be. Thank you for listening.